turn to the book of the prophet Habakkuk. Don't be embarrassed to use the index. This morning we're only going to read the first five verses of the first chapter and then I want to give the background and introduction. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received begins with Habakkuk's complaint. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. And then comes the Lord's answer. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. Ever since World War I, the Church of Christ in this country has been declining. And if the trends go on as they are, by the end of this decade, in the year 1990, the Church will be a tiny ghetto, surrounded by a completely pagan society. Unless God has mercy on us during this decade and does something new, then we are finished as a nation in his sight. And by the end of this decade we would be where most churches are in most countries of the world, unable to influence the affairs of the nation in which they find themselves. We are in a desperately serious situation. And because the church has been declining and has now reached such a low ebb, probably about 1.5% of the population, and in inner city areas as low as 0.5%, we no longer have the quantity or quality of Christians to influence society. We have ceased to act as salt and light. When people ask me how much salt or light is needed, my response would be about 5%. I've noticed again and again that where Christians number around 5%, something happens something changes in the effect and influence of those Christians on society. Instead of being voices crying in the wilderness, one Christian trying to witness to another unbeliever, there is a communal presence of Christians which reverses the trend in society and begins to change the environment. I've seen this happen in an estate, I've seen it happen in a school staff room, in fact, in our local hospital in Surrey it happened and the chief uh, nursing executive officer, formerly called the matron, asked me to call and see her before she retired and when I went to see her she said, will you please thank the church for what they've done in this hospital? And I said, well, I'm not aware of anything that they've done. I know that one of our members wheels a trolley around and sells soap to the patients, but I'm just not aware. Well, she said, since I've been matron, there has been a complete change in atmosphere in this hospital. The relationships among the staff and between the staff and patients have changed for the better. And she said, I've tried to track down what the influence is and I find out that there are nurses from your church who are responsible. And I did a little research and discovered that in that hospital, which is quite a large one, there were then over 5% Christian nurses. So once again the trends were being reversed, the tide was turning. But over the country we are not in a position to do this. And therefore it's no surprise to see that the country is reflecting the lack of Christian influence. Indeed there is nothing now to stop the rot. Because we are responsible for God for that situation, for the state of our nation. 
It's no use us blaming the people outside. It is God's church who is responsible. We are responsible because we were the only ones who could stop it. And we are now too weak and too small to do so. And so we see the foundations of our society being destroyed. Psalm 11, there's a little verse in there where King David, or somebody says to King David, when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And there's a sense of helplessness. And therefore I detect among many Christians a sense of escapism, a running away from the situation. Running into conferences like this, running into one bless up after another, running into holy huddles, running away from the situation and retreating from areas of society which Satan then moves in on. And when we realize what he's done, we then hold a protest march in Trafalgar Square, but it's too late, it's bolting the stable door after the horse has gone. What God is calling us to do in this generation is to get back into the world and to retake the territory from which we've retreated and begin again an aggressive movement that will recapture the nation for God. That's what we're being called to do. And part of the renewal movement which took place over the last 10 to 15 years was God's way of getting his church ready for that move, of preparing us to be able to do that. And instead of retreat, 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 which we've all been doing for the last 70 years, to go on to the advance and to go back into the world and to take it again to go back into politics, to go back into the trade unions, to go back into the mass media, to go back and take again the world for Christ. Now to do that, we've got to do some pretty honest and realistic thinking as to where we are. And the simple fact is that because the church has been declining, the fringe of the church has also been declining, and most of our evangelism takes place in the church and its fringe, not outside, alas. And therefore evangelism has been operating in an ever-decreasing circle of influence. There has been only one year since World War I when the churches showed growth rather than decline. That was the year 1955, one year after Dr. Billy Graham came to Haringey. And his visit to Haringey reversed the trend for just 12 months. None of his subsequent visits have managed to do that. He is, at the moment, considering an invitation to come back to these shores. As you know, he's not too well physically, so he's had to postpone consideration. But that's not the only reason he postponed it. He was very uncertain about God's purpose for these islands. He came over to Oxford and Cambridge, as you know recently, and said on BBC Radio after that visit, I had not realized how godless Britain had become since my last visit. He did not mean how immoral, because for standard of morals, there's not much to choose between America and Britain. But the big difference is this. Over the other side of the Atlantic, you can say the word God and be understood. People have what I would call a God framework to their life. They know what you mean when you say God. They have some reaction, some content to the word. Whereas here now, the vast majority of the people are embarrassed by the word God or even indifferent to the word God. There is no God framework within which the good news of Jesus can make any sense. And so Billy, when he came to Oxford and Cambridge, found he had to start much further back and talk about utterly simple things about God and he couldn't just come in with the good news of Jesus. Now I've been noticing that too. I was speaking to a group of students in Guildford Technical College. They were mostly English, well educated, they'd been through our schools and therefore presumably through some kind of compulsory religious education. And yet in the middle of my talk a girl stopped me and said, you keep using a word I don't understand. And I thought, now what on earth is the word I'm using? Justification? Sanctification? Glorification? I couldn't recall using any theological jargon. I said, what word is that? She said, God. I said, go on, pull the other one. She said, no, I mean it. I said, you don't know what I mean by the word God. She said, no, what's that? 
My wife and I on the way up here on Saturday switched on the radio for any questions. And David Jacobs was chairing the program somewhere in the Thames Valley, Sonning, I believe. And one of the questions, the third question was, would the members of the team state whether they believe in God and what difference that belief makes to their life, if any? That was quite a question. You sensed immediately David Jacobs was embarrassed and didn't know how to handle it. And then they went through the entire team. There was not one able to say, I believe in God. Not one. Barbara Castle made some joke about why does everybody call God he when it could be she? And most of the others said, well, we'd have to say we're not sure and we don't know. And they fumbled the question after being so dogmatic and so knowledgeable on all the other questions. They didn't know what to do with this question. Now that is our responsibility, not theirs. For many of them have never had presented clearly an understanding of God that makes sense and that is true to reality. And therefore I believe that before we can go out and talk about the Holy Spirit and certainly before we can go out and talk about Jesus Christ we are called to talk about God and restore the God framework. For unless we restore the God framework to people's awareness, unless we can convince them that God is involved in their life, that God has feelings too and that he's already emotionally responding and reacting to where they are, unless we can do that, then frankly the good news about Jesus doesn't make sense. Jesus is simply a guru. He's simply a great human being. That's why 35 million people could watch the film Jesus of Nazareth on television a year ago and then the previous year before that 35 million sat glued to the screen for five hours watching Jesus of Nazareth that's over half the population and I haven't seen any queue of people trying to get in church into church as a result of you how many converts have you come across I've come across four and you've come across two that makes six and I've asked around the country and I've discovered this that though most people who watched that and it was a good film if you saw it it was a good presentation a bit wobbly on the resurrection but for the rest it was good <laughs> and yet when I've asked I've discovered this most people said great film most moving it really touched me but the four and now two more who have been converted I found with my four and I'll inquire about the two afterwards that one was a lapsed Roman Catholic, one was a girl running away from a brethren home, and two were nominal churchgoers. They all had a God framework in their background somewhere. <coughs> if you go to Southern Ireland, you'll find that everybody has a God framework, but everybody. They may not know God personally, but if you say God, that means something. Whereas in England, it does not. Now, what is the ministry that is going to correct this situation? The answer is the prophetic ministry. For it is the task of the prophetic ministry to prepare the way for the evangelistic, which in turn prepares the way for the pastoral. But we've got a whole lot of people, a whole lot of men in this country, who are engaged in pastoral ministry. There are more clergy and ministers per head of population than doctors. We have an increasing number of men involved in evangelism. But where, oh where, are the prophets? If I may oversimplify, the prophet talks about God, the evangelist about Jesus, and the pastor is concerned with the Holy Spirit and working out the fellowship gifts and fruit of the Spirit. And so we're stuck in the pastoral ministry, concentrating on the Holy Spirit, when way, way back, God is wanting to restore and revive a prophetic ministry. This is the divine pre-evangelism. It may sound a bit obvious to you, but the Old Testament comes before the New. Had you noticed that? Had you noticed that before God could send Jesus or the Holy Spirit, he sent centuries of prophets to get the place ready? And the prophetic ministry from Moses to Malachi got at least one nation ready to receive the good news of Jesus. 
that's God's way of getting people ready of making them so aware of himself that there is some fear of God and then can come the good news of the love of God where there's no knowledge of God's wrath there will be no understanding of God's mercy where there is no fear of the Lord there can be no love of the Lord and the prophetic ministry gets ready that's why even in the New Testament John the Baptist had to come first before Jesus could begin his ministry. Have you ever asked why? Have you ever asked what would have happened if John the Baptist had not come first and Jesus had just started? John the Baptist was the last of the line of the prophetic ministries that prepared the way for Jesus and John came making people so aware of God and so aware of what God was feeling about their daily life that something of the fear of God came into them. For example, he said, be content with your wages. Can you imagine doing that outside British Leyland Gates today? That's what the prophetic ministry will have to do until people realize there is some connection between God and wages. And John the Baptist said, you have too many clothes, go home and empty your wardrobes. That's pretty practical. So God is interested in my clothes. This is the prophetic ministry. Now many people feel that that prophetic ministry came to a full stop in the New Testament somewhere. I shall expand more fully in later mornings on the real teaching of the New Testament which is now God can have an entire people who are a prophetic people. Regardless of age, sex and class he wants to pour out his spirit on all flesh so that young men and old men, men servant, maid servant, may prophesy. And you are called to a prophetic ministry. And frankly, I would consider these Bible studies a waste of time unless at least some of you began a prophetic ministry as a result. Because the whole point of the renewal movement, as I said on Saturday night, was not to make our worship a little less boring, was not to make our fellowship a little more enjoyable, but to create a prophetic people and to revive a prophetic ministry not within the church so that at our meetings we can say, bless you, God loves you, but so that we could prophesy to the people outside. That's where the prophetic ministry is meant to be. And so in the Old Testament we've got models of the prophets, all kinds of men and women, all kinds of different backgrounds, different types, who found themselves getting into a prophetic ministry. And on those models we build our own understanding because the only difference between the Old and the New Testament as regards the prophetic ministry is that in the New Testament there are going to be many, many more. Same kind of thing but many, many more. And it's with that in mind that we're going to study the prophet Habakkuk. He's probably hardly known to some of you. He's in glory this morning. I'm dying to meet him. In fact, I will die to meet him, but I'm, I'm just <laughs> looking forward to meeting this man because as I've studied his, his work and got into his heart, I've felt very close to this man. And I believe by the end of the week you'll feel you know him and that when you spot him in glory, you'll say, why, that's Habakkuk. And you'll look forward to going over and shaking his hand. So let me spend the rest of this morning just giving you a bit of background, a bit of introduction as much as I can, and then we'll just get into those first five verses. And uh, I think I had about 11 minutes injury time at the beginning, so uh, we'll, we'll leave you plenty of time for coffee. Now, it's a very short book, it's only three little chapters, and therefore it's been described as one of the minor prophets. I, I don't like that term at all. To God, all prophets are important, whether they speak a little or speak a lot. And even if God only gave you three words for somebody else, that, that's prophecy. You don't need to do it at length for 50 years, like some of them did, or 25 years, like Jeremiah did. There are some prophets in the Old Testament who only speak once and then as far as we know they disappear but they've given a message from God. That's all that a prophet is. He is someone who has heard a message 
and who passes it on to the right people. That's all. It's such a simple ministry. You don't need to be theologically educated. You don't need to be a public speaker. In fact, God seems to entrust this ministry to those who don't have a gift of oratory. And it's exciting to hear people, ordinary folk, who'd never be able to get up into a pulpit and preach a sermon, hear from God and pass on a word from God. Really exciting. Let's go back to Moses, for example. Now, Moses was a pretty major prophet, a pretty big one. He said an awful lot that he heard from God. But we're told that Moses was scared to pass it on, at least when the message was for Pharaoh. And Moses said, I couldn't do that. I'm no speaker. I couldn't do that. And God, with some impatience, said, All right, Moses, you will not be the prophet to Pharaoh. Aaron will be your prophet. Now, that's an interesting use of the term. Aaron's job as the prophet to Moses was very simple. All he had to do was to listen to what Moses said, and if Moses said, let my people go, Aaron had to take that message, go to Pharaoh, and say, God says, let my people go. He didn't have to sit down and study it for hours. He didn't have to say, now, how can I make this attractive to Pharaoh? He didn't have to say, now, I'll try and get three points out of that. My people, my people, let my people, let my people go and then find a good introduction, a good conclusion and some good illustrations to liven it up and then go to Pharaoh and say, Pharaoh, I've got a word from the Lord for you. My introduction, point one, point two. That's not what Aaron had to do. To be a good prophet, the only thing Aaron had to do was to listen carefully to Moses and then speak carefully to Pharaoh. That's all. And that is a ministry within reach of everybody who's listening to my voice now. There is only one qualification you're going to need, and I won't tell you what that is till Friday morning. But it's open to you, wide open. It's not only open to you, do you realize that God is longing to talk? The idea that when God gave the last page of this book that he shut up and became dumb for 2,000 years, is totally unscriptural. It's a libel on God. God is wanting to talk today to people, but his frustration is that he can't get enough people to listen and then speak. That's all. He's looking for messengers. And dear old Habakkuk was one of them. Minor prophet, neither minor nor major. He was simply a man who heard something from God and who passed it on. That's all. So I'm not going to take a big prophet. I'm not going to take a famous prophet. I'm just going to take an ordinary man who never even intended to be a prophet, who had no blinding vision, who had no great call, who wasn't suddenly standing in the middle of a field and lightning struck a tree in front of him and a big voice like thunder said, Habakkuk, you must be a prophet. They didn't happen that way. It almost happened accidentally. He just didn't expect it. And there he is, one of God's immortals. Now, when you first read the book, which is one of the less well-known passages of Scripture, unfortunately, when you first read it, it strikes you that there are one or two unusual features about this as a prophecy. When you read chapter 1, you find that this man did most of his talking to God, not to people. And we tend to think of a, a prophet as someone getting up in a public square and addressing the multitudes and haranguing the throngs, but in fact this man talked to God. And we're going to learn quite a lot from that. That's where it begins. A prophet is someone who's on speaking terms with God. The second thing, when you read the second chapter, you notice something unusual about that. You find that when he delivered his message to the people, he didn't speak it. And God has a multitude of ways of passing on the message. He wrote it. Have you ever considered that a prophetic ministry cons consists of writing? I may tell you later in the week of a letter that God told me to write a few days before the general election last year telling Margaret Thatcher that God was going to make her the Prime Minister. And I just began by saying I want to be the first in the country to congratulate you. I'll tell you later what happened as a result of that letter. But you could write it. You don't need to get up and speak. You could write it, as long as you've heard. In fact, Habakkuk had to write it up in great big letters on a poster, on a hoarding. 
so large that somebody running past could get the message. And it might be that somebody here in advertising could become a prophet of God and put some things up on our hoarding, hoardings. I'm not sure that some of the texts in Gothic letters that go up on our posters really do much more than encourage Christians or relieve their conscience. But I've seen some snappy things put up. There's a vicar in Liverpool, for example. Uh, if I mention his name, some of you would know him. He's, he's a little dynamo, a lovely man. And um, he's got a, a wooden fence alongside a motorway, so he goes out periodically with a, a pot of paint and a big brush. And uh, at Easter, I remember he wrote up, Jesus is dying to meet you. And then the authorities made him take that down. So Christmas followed, and so he put up, Santa Claus never died for anybody. Great big letters. But you know, everybody going past that fence is getting the message. He's hearing something from God, and he's putting it up in big letters. Habakkuk did that. Have you got a garden fence? Well, I hope that while most of you laugh, somebody might just take that seriously. Because that's what Habakkuk did. And then you read the third chapter, and you find that the third chapter has to be set to music. I've written a hymn for that third chapter when we get to it. If anybody knows how I could get it duplicated before Friday morning, I'd be most grateful if you'd let me know. But it says that we're to sing that third chapter. And when we get to that, I want to explore with you the connection between the prophetic ministry and music. There is a profound connection which many Christian musicians have not yet seen. In fact, very few have seen. We've seen the use of music in worship. We've seen the use of music in evangelism. But very few have yet seen the prophetic ministry of music and how to use their instruments and their lyrics for a prophetic ministry to tell people what God is feeling and what God is saying now today. I'm trying to encourage poets to get into a prophetic ministry, artists to get into a prophetic ministry. But that's another unusual feature of Habakkuk. He sets your feet a dancing by the end. He doesn't begin there, far from it. He doesn't feel like dancing much at the beginning, but by the end, he's really got you into it. Well, it's unique and full of interest. It's a difficult little book to translate. The translators tell me it's one of the hardest to get in from Hebrew into English. There's one verse, verse 9 in chapter 3, where there are over 100 possible different readings. Can you imagine a translator's job when he's got to choose between 100 different translations of the verse? Nevertheless, we've got a good English translation. I'm going to use the New International Version, which I hope you're getting into. I think it's soon going to be the most popular in this country. But our real interest this morning is in the prophet, not the prophecy. Who was he? What was he? How did he get started? Dear old Habakkuk, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. Some people say Habakkuk. I can never get my tongue around that, so we're going to stay with Habakkuk. And when I get to glory, I'll go and say, how do, how do you say your name? And he'll tell me, well, the Lord's given me a new name now, so there we are. I don't even find any help in the meaning of his name. The Hebrew word Habakkuk either means a vegetable, which doesn't help me much. Fancy calling your little child a vegetable. Or else it means an embrace. Well, that's a bit better. Hello, Habakkuk. And we'll embrace him. But that doesn't give us a clue. What kind of a job did he have? I don't know. Was he a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker? Not a clue. One of God's nobodies. And God loves to use nobodies and confound the somebodies with them. He loves to take people who are nobody and really show the somebodies what he can do why he took a little parlour maid, Gladys Aylward, and took her out to China to show what he can do with a nobody. And if you feel you're a nobody, you're probably well qualified for a prophetic ministry. Then how did he get started? What are we looking for as we study this little book? Well, we could say we're going to be looking at the different aspects of a prophetic ministry. We shall look at prophetic prayer in chapter 1 at prophetic preaching in chapter 2, and prophetic praise in chapter 3. 
you see the prophetic ministry can be a whole lot of things it's related to so much but I think my main interest in studying this was to ask not how did the prophet get hold of his message but how did God get hold of the prophet that's more interesting and more important and I see that there was an amazing interchange between the Almighty and this nobody whereby God first of all got hold of his mind he made him think he blew his mind in fact God said what I'm going to tell you I haven't told you before because you wouldn't believe it anyway but he stretched his mind he made him think about what was happening in his nation the second part of him that God got hold of was his will God had to force him almost to do something about it it's all very well to stay up in the thinking realm I'm afraid many people's interest in prophecy stays there they read prophetic books they buy all the latest sensational Christian literature on the end of the world and and get the latest program and timetable and all the details because they're interested and God is saying what are you going to do about that I don't want prophetic minds that are just wanting to explore the end of the world I want prophetic wills that are going to act upon what you know and then I see God pressing further to the citadel of this man pressing on for his heart touching his emotions and if there's one thing God needs to do with many Christians it's to get down to the heart it's only 18 mi inches from the head to the heart but oh what a long journey it is and he needs prophets who feel prophets who can share his heart prophets who know his anger prophets who know his agony prophets who share his joy and share his grief and we're going to see that by the end of these three chapters God has Habakkuk's mind his will and his heart and he's got a prophet well now there's only one helpful clue to the background that I want to deal with and then we'll go into the book itself we can work out when this man was a prophet even if we don't know who he was what he was we can tell you when if you jot down the year 600 BC you're just about on somewhere around 600 BC and that tells us quite a lot he was a contemporary of Jeremiah of Nahum and one or two others and yet so far as we know he didn't have any contact with them the prophets seem to have been rather lonely people they didn't have a lot to do with each other almost as if they had to be loners with God but it tells us what kind of a background what was happening in his situation and the astonishing thing is if you read what was happening in 600 AD it's like reading tomorrow's newspaper it's where we are and that's why I believe Habakkuk's message is absolutely right for our country in 1980 it's as if different parts of the Bible become most relevant and most real there are some parts of the Bible that don't seem just directly relevant to us today but Habakkuk is right on right on let me tell you what was happening around 600 AD and you'll see the parallel first let's look what was happening internationally around the then known world the world was divided between two superpowers to the west Egypt to the east Assyria and there had been a major struggle between these two powers which was now quietening down and looked as if it was going to be resolved but they had been through tremendous tension between east and west but on the international scene something else was happening which was complicating that picture and just beginning to raise questions a new world superpower was emerging on the eastern side its name Babylon no one as yet really realized what it was going to mean but people were beginning to talk and ask so you had two major superpowers east and west 
with a kind of hot cold war between them and a third power arising on the east whose significance people hadn't yet realized. If I draw the parallel today it would be between American capitalism and, and Russian communism with the allies of America and probably including China. But the new power that's arising on the East is Islam. Since 1973, Islam is resurgent, it is militant, and all of us have the feeling that somehow this power is going to affect our lives deeply. It affected the cost of getting to Aberystwyth for the Fountain Trust Conference, the price of petrol in your tank is due to that third power that discovered its muscles in 1973. So the international scene is very, very like the background to Habakkuk, isn't it? Have you got the feel of it? Now what was happening within the nation around 600 AD? Let me give you a bit of history. I'm sorry to do that. I loathe history. I find it very boring, don't you? At school it was one of my worst subjects. Kings and queens and battles and dates yuck um, 1066 and all that sums up my knowledge of history but we've got to know a little if we're going to understand the Bible around 600 AD this was the picture BC thank you my wife there uh, keeps me right BC that shows you what a good historian I am of course I made that mistake deliberately to see if you were listening <laughs> Right. Around 600 BC, this is what was happening in the nation. There had been a good king about 20 years previously, a boy king, a man called Josiah or Josiah. And he had rediscovered in an old cupboard in the temple, when they spring cleaned the temple, the book of God's law. And when he read it, he was horrified and realized that unless there was a change, his nation over which he reigned was, was doomed. And he tried to reform the nation. He really did. He tried very hard to clean up their morals, to clean up their religious life. And he did it through the law. And he imposed that reform on society. And he tried to make people good by act of parliament. And it doesn't work. You can attain a certain temporary improvement in public behavior, but you can't change people. And it will not be permanent, and it will slip. I fear that there are many Christians in our country today who are hoping that somehow the politicians and the police between them will clean up public morals. I beg you, read a little history. The kind of thing the Ayatollah Khomeini is achieving in Iran, we do not want here. That is reform without renewal, reform without revival. But I hear Christians talking like this. Why don't they clean up Britain? Why don't they pass stricter laws? Why don't the police do their job? Why don't the politicians wake up? Let me say that more than an act of parliament is needed. And however much you press for the change of law, unless there is a change of heart accompanying it, then the faith that came to Josiah's reform will come to any reform in this country. I want to underline that. Let's take, for example, abortion. One baby every six minutes is being thrown into the incinerator, and that was a baby that God knew personally, that he was looking forward to enjoying, whose potential he knew, whose personality he knew. How does he feel about that? Well, we've pressed for law changes. Even if we achieved a change in the law, that will not be enough because the change of heart would not be there. And in a democracy, the law can only apply what the majority of people actually want. And so Josiah made the mistake of thinking that if he changed the law and imposed that, that this would straighten the situation out. Josiah was exactly the same age as Jeremiah. They were contemporaries. They were born the same time. And Jeremiah would have nothing to do with Josiah's reform. Have you ever noticed that? Because Jeremiah knew it was no use. And therefore he didn't support it. 
and he just told the people that it was no use. And why? Jeremiah was after a change of heart. He was after renewal, not reform. And the result was, of course, that as soon as Josiah died, in fact he was killed, he was killed meddling in the great superpower struggle, he went to Armageddon, and there he was killed by the Egyptians. When Josiah died, the reform collapsed, and he was followed by a king, Jehoiakim, who was a pleasure lover, who built himself a bigger palace, who was concerned not with the welfare of his people, but with his own status. And because the ruler at the top was like this, everybody followed him and everybody became concerned with status. Not with morals, but with status. And an age of materialism set in. And everybody was after what they could get in an improved standard of living. More pleasure, more comfort, more things, more things. And whenever that happens, you know the result. As material prosperity rises, moral character declines. It always happens. And in Habakkuk's day, it had really happened. And the nation was in a sorry state. For one thing, the law was paralyzed. It seemed as if law and order could not be maintained. People flouted the law if they could. And in fact, we are now in our country in a situation where crime actually pays. Did you know that? Some 65% of crimes are not now found out. So, in fact, you've more than a 50-50 chance of getting away with it. It pays. On balance, you can get away with it now. And this had all kinds of effects in society for Habakkuk's day. Exploitation. Might was right. If you were strong, you got away with it. And the people who couldn't defend themselves were trampled down and down and down. But the one thing that became characteristic of society in his day, which he talks about most, was that it became a violent society. You could not walk the streets at night. Mugging was common. Robbery in broad daylight was common. Violence was the feature of his society. Now, you know, whenever God withdraws his spirit from any country, any nation, any society, the one thing that will appear is violence. Read Genesis 6, where God was just grieved that he ever made men. He got sick of the whole business, and he withdrew his spirit from them and said, my spirit isn't going to struggle with you forever. And you know what happened? Almost the next verse, violence filled the earth. I've just come back from a trip overseas and over the Atlantic and there are streets over there I wouldn't walk even during the day, never mind at night. Do you know in New York they're now mugging and knocking people down and the people who are knocking them down have pliers and with the pliers they're pulling out their gold fillings because of the price of gold. That's going to come here. There are already places in London where you cannot walk alone at night. You cannot go on the tube trains at certain hours. You know this is happening here. And it's spreading. That's what Habakkuk found in his nation. Does all this sound strangely familiar? It is familiar because it's part of real life. Well, now let's just pause at that moment and say, how do you feel about the state of our nation? How do you really feel? How deeply does it upset you? How burdened are you? How concerned are you? Or do you try and keep it out of your mind as much as possible? Do you find in your religion, do you find in your spiritual activity, a kind of recharging center that enables you to go right into that world and to face it? Or do you find your spiritual activity an escape from that world so that you can forget its pressure? Habakkuk was a man who felt this so deeply that his spirit cried out about it. And bless him, he cried out not to the people, but first of all to God. That's how his prophetic ministry began.
the frustration he felt, the burden he felt, the anger he felt, the anxiety he felt, the insecurity he felt, he cried out to God and says, God, God, how long? How long are you going to let this go on? And that's when his prophetic ministry was born. And so now at last we're in a position to begin our study of Habakkuk. All that's been introduction. Oh, I must move quickly. Just an angry, frustrated man giving God an earful. That's how it began. I have to confess now that Habakkuk didn't have the advantage of hearing Tom Smale on practical theology of prayer. So I'm afraid he didn't just abide by the rules of last night. That was good stuff last night, but Habakkuk hadn't the advantage of knowing all that. So let's look at his prayer. He dares to criticize God. He dares to shout at God. He dares to tell God, what do you think you're doing? Why are you tolerating all this? Why are you doing nothing about it? Why are you letting it happen? And that's how it began. You see, I said earlier, the prophet is on speaking terms with God. That means that he's prepared to tell God whatever is in his heart. And if there's one virtue in Habakkuk's prayer, it is that it was an honest prayer. I just want to encourage you this morning to be honest with God. Tell him exactly how you feel about him too. He can take it. Argue with God. Yes, argue with him. I will warn you that you will not win the argument. Habakkuk didn't, but he argued. Do you know, I, I almost feel that God is longing for a prayer that will be bold enough really to tell him what we think of him. Really to challenge him. Really to call on him and to cry to him. Even if it sounds rude, even if it borders on blasphemy, I think God responds to someone who hammers at him. He really does. He can take it. And he would rather you did that than giving polite prayers that are not really honest. I had a lovely letter recently from Zimbabwe from uh, an elderly lady. I think she was 84, was she? Um, and she had been listening to some tapes of messages of mine. She wrote this letter. She said, 20 years ago, I had a very nasty car accident and it left me completely crippled and in real pain. And she said, I could struggle around on sticks. But then, three years ago, the doctor told me I would be completely helpless and I'd need to be looked after. And he said I would be in a wheelchair. And he, she said, I was just so angry. She was alone. She had no one to look after her. And she went home and she determined to end it all. And so she got together all her drugs and all her pills. And it was midnight. And before she ended it all, she decided to tell God exactly what she thought of him. And she said, I cursed God for three hours. I told him exactly what I thought. And she said, every promise in the Bible I could remember, I threw in his face and said, it's not true, it's not true, you don't mean it. And for three hours she cursed God from midnight till 3 a.m. And then she went to get the pills. And whether she tripped and fell or whether she fainted, she doesn't know. But she fell across the bed unconscious. When she woke up, it was so bright that she was sure she had died and was facing God and facing his glory. And she was scared stiff remembering that her last part of life had been cursing God for three hours. She was frightened. And then she realized that her hands, she could feel them. And she felt the rest of her body and it was pretty solid. And she realized that it was the sunlight streaming in through the bedroom window. And so she thought, well, but I feel so different, why? And she stood up and realized she had no more pain. So she ran around the bedroom and realized she could run. She could run. 
So she ran out of the house and she ran down to the shops and she told everybody the shops. And then she ran to a doctor and she ran into the surgery. And he said, my, you're looking lively this morning. <laughs> and she said, the Lord has healed me. And the doctor said, hallelujah. And she wrote to me three years later to tell me that she was without pain, running around at 84. And it was the result of cursing God for three hours. Isn't God amazing? <laughs> you see, one thing Tom was saying last night was so right. You don't need to be correct in your prayer. You need to be real. You do need to be real. And Habakkuk says, God, how long are you going to let this go on? How long are you going to let our nation slide like this? How long are you going to make me watch injustice? How much longer do I have to cry to you? How much longer do I have to pray? How long, how long, how long? All I can see is violence everywhere. Lord, I... I what are you doing? Why do you tolerate wrong? That's his exact phrase. Why are you tolerating it? Boy, that's real prayer, isn't it? And God can take it right on the chin. And God can give as good as he gets, even better. But God responded to that man because here was a man who was burdened for his country, really burdened, who was angry about it, who was frustrated who couldn't understand why God did nothing about it. The real truth was, as we shall see, that in fact God is usually much more tolerant than God's people. Have you ever noticed that? God's much more patient than I am. Martin Luther once said, if I'd been God, I'd have kicked the whole world to pieces centuries ago. Have you ever felt like that? Jonah felt like that. That was really why Jonah wouldn't go to Nineveh. God said, go to Nineveh and preach against them. And Jonah said, no fear. You've had me once. I'm not going to be bitten twice. And he had, if you read the book of Kings, God had sent him to his own nation once and Jonah had gone. And the result was that God had let the people off. And as soon as God let them off, they went right back into sin and crime and vice. And Jonah said, I'm not just not going to go through that twice. Didn't I say this to you? when I was in my own country. I'm not going to go through that twice, Lord. If I go and preach to Nineveh, I know what you'll do. You'll let them off and they'll go back into all that they're doing that's wrong. I know, Lord. I've seen it. And God said, Jonah, you get out there and go and preach them. And Jonah did. And they did repent and God did let them off. And Jonah sat under a tree outside the city and he said, right, I'll just wait and see what happens, Lord. You see, you see. You've let them off and you'll see. You tolerate wrong and they'll, they'll do anything to get away with it. You just watch. And God said, Jonah, there are 120,000 kids in that city that aren't old enough to know right from wrong. Don't you think I feel for them? And even the cattle, do you, don't, do you not think I feel for them? You see, we're so intolerant that we say, Lord, why don't you do something about all this? Why don't you stop the crime? Why don't you stop all these dreadful things happening? God is more tolerant than we are. We say, why do you tolerate it, Lord? And sometimes I think the Lord wants to say, well, I had to tolerate quite a lot in you, you know. And if I'd acted as soon as you went wrong, you wouldn't even be praying to me now. Well, Habakkuk was honest. His prayer was intercessory prayer. He was praying for the nation, burdened by it. And one of the hopeful signs in our day is the growth in intercession for the nation. Have you noticed that growth? Some of you are part of it, not all of you yet. It was importunate prayer in that it was hammering at God. And again, we just supplement last night with the teaching of Jesus in parable after parable. He said, go on hammering at the door of heaven. You'll get it. Go on asking and you'll receive. Go on knocking and the door will be opened. Go on seeking and you'll find. Go on, keep on hammering it at heaven's door there is a truth there that we need to know and Habakkuk had kept on but above all he was offering what I want to call interrogatory prayer do you know what I mean by interrogatory prayer I mean asking God questions why God how long God what are you going to do about it God and believing you'll get an answer this phrase, answered prayer, needs a little understanding. 
too often it means if somebody says do you know my prayer was answered they mean they got a result that's not what the Bible means by answered prayer by answered prayer in the Bible God means when you get a reply when you get a reply that's answered prayer so much prayer is like speaking into a telephone without pressing button A or whatever you do now <laughs> It's, it's feeling there's nobody at the other end and you wait and then if something happens you say oh I've had an answered prayer you didn't have an answered prayer you get an answered prayer when you get a reply do you follow me? it's not the result that answers your prayer it's the reply and interrogatory prayer expects not a result but a reply and Habakkuk was asking questions saying God answer me how long? why? and God replied God replied and the reply made Habakkuk into a prophet. That's all. Have you ever tried asking God questions and going on asking until you get a reply? The reply could make you a prophet because what God says will be the message that he once passed on. And tomorrow morning we'll look at what God replied. It was so extraordinary God said, Habakkuk, you'll never believe it. And sure enough, Habakkuk didn't. <laughs> but he got an answer. He got an answer. God replied. Let's pray. Father, as I look at the faces gathered in front of me now, I just praise you that your Holy Spirit was poured out so that young men should see visions and old men dream dreams. And men servants and maid servants should prophesy and sons and daughters should prophesy. Lord, I ask that as we study your servant Habakkuk and all that he did and said, that you'll quicken a prophetic people here that will speak your word to this land. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.